Colossians chapter 2. Find your place in Colossians. One of the Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians, and Colossians. What do they have in common? Anybody know what we call those commonly when we put them all together? They're letters from Paul, and uh, they have something in common regards to the place that they were written. Anybody know right off the top of your head? It might say it in your Bible. Commonly known as the prison epistles. Can you guess where Paul was when he was writing these uh, letters? He was in prison. Uh, you, you guys remember uh, uh, Bruce that came, Dr. Bruce that came and shared with us a few weeks ago. Uh, he got to go back to Rome and, and see uh, the prison. Uh, so I'm going I'm to be visiting with him next week. I'll say you said hello, okay? And uh, on the campus at Southwestern. And he... Um, is going to tell me about that experience, uh, what it was like to see the prison that, was, that held Paul and uh, where Paul wrote what we're going to read today, okay? So uh, we're looking at Colossians. We're, we're at chapter 2. And if you wouldn't mind, skip down to the second half there of, of uh, actually the, the beginning there, verse 6. Let's start at verse 6. So then... So then, just as you received Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith, as you were taught and overflowing with thanksgiving. See to it that no one take you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. Boy, that is a, a key word for us today, isn't it? Um, hollow and deceptive philosophy. Whenever people are talking to us in culture about what they believe and why they don't believe this and why they believe something else, you need to know the end from the beginning. You need to know where their philosophy leads. There's a lot of uh, in recent days uh, talk about uh, socialism as an example. Uh, where does socialism always lead? Where does it take you? Uh, and so when we think about a philosophy that someone presents, we need to know, because it always sounds good, um, they always are convinced and encouraged by whatever it is that they bring to us. And we just need to understand, and that's what it's talking about here, know where the end is from the beginning. For, um, he, he says, uh, see that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition, and the element, uh, elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Anything that is not, he says, a philosophy that is not centered or anchored in Jesus is a man-made philosophy that's going to take you nowhere. It will crumble and be destroyed. Verse 9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought, bought uh, to fullness, uh, he is the head of every power and authority in him. You were also circumcised. And if, you're, if you have your Bibles out, I want you to underline this. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision perf uh, not performed by human hands. Everybody say, hey, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> With a circumcision, not we're going to come back to that in a minute, not performed by human hands. Your whole self-ruled uh, uh, by the flesh was put off when, you're cir when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who praised him or who raised him from the dead, uh, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The question for us today um, deals with baptism. Next week, we're going to uh, be baptizing some candidates. And as Michelle said, we'd like to know if you want to participate in this. And uh, just as a little side note, uh, on Saturday, we'll set up. So 
how does 10 a.m. sound? If any of you are available at 10 a.m. on Saturday, we'll set up the baptistry, get it ready. This is a great celebration, but let's talk about what it really is, what the essence of baptism is. Is baptism part of your salvation? In other words, is it, is it a mandatory piece that you're not really saved unless you're baptized? Or is baptism rather uh, kind of an initiation ceremony? You know, you go through initiation ceremonies to show you belong to something. And, and is that what baptism is? Is it, Baptism is an initiation ceremony that shows that you are a Christian. Or is there something more to baptism? And we're heading into some deep water, so I want you to hang on with me as we charge through what Paul is teaching us about baptism and what is happening and, and what it is not and what it actually is. I hadn't been at uh, Bible school too long, and I had a, you know, I came to Bible school with, with a basic theology on various uh, subject matter like baptism. I thought I was, you know, uh, pretty well convinced what baptism was, and, uh, I, but I had never really been challenged. No one had ever challenged me, and I had never really looked at it in any other direction. And so when I got to Bible school, I met a young man who was studying for ministry, and he immediately challenged me. And in his mind, baptism was uh, connected to salvation. In other words, if someone is, 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 uh, becomes a Christian, makes a profession of their faith to Christ, and asks him to be the Lord and leader of their life, if they're not baptized, then they, are, they haven't finished the process. And so they are not going to heaven. They need to be baptized. And he had a couple of passages of scripture that he uh, you know, had memorized and he shared with me to prove his point. And one of them is in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent, this is where Peter is, is uh, talking, he begins a sermon uh, after the day of Pentecost. And he says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins and ye uh, shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he uh, also read or quoted this passage for me out of 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 20 and 21. It's hearkening back, Peter's remembering back to the days of Noah. And uh, he's, he's talking about, you know, what disobedient people and how uh, there was, uh, you know, the, that uh, Noah was spared or saved out of this group of disobedient people, which sometimes were disobedient, he said, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a whole teaching that we could go into that's not what we're going to be talking about today. So suffice to say that whenever you are challenged by someone with a, a particular brand of theology that doesn't sound right or a doctrinal statement that you think, I don't know if that's really Jesus and if that sounds too much like uh, what he teaches in Scripture. One thing we need to understand when we are trying to put together a doctrine or understanding of what the Bible is saying to us is that the things that God teaches us doctrinally are going to be from the beginning to the end. You cannot just selectively grab a couple of passages and of Scripture somewhere and create a belief system. So this needs to be something, if it is a part of salvation, if baptism is a part of salvation, it needs to be something that we would see clean through Scripture. All the way through, we could see a picture of this being attached uh, to our salvation. But instead, what we see from the book of beginnings all the way forward is we see some rituals and, and things that men are called to do by God that are symbolic of what is to come and, and what's uh, about to take place. So it took me several uh, weeks of examining scripture with my new friend to help him to open to there being a possible new understanding than he had grown up with. Uh, with respect to, to what our salvation is really hinged on. Do we have any work part in it? Or is it all on God and God's work and it's just our surrender to what he wants to do in our hearts and lives? And so we talked through this and we came to, to understand and to see that baptism is not a, um, 
a part of salvation. And tackling these scriptures that we just read, let me ask you a couple of questions. How many of you believe Noah was saved by the water? Anybody believe? There were some people outside in the water. Were they saved (laughs) by the water? Noah was saved by what? What was Noah floating in? Noah was saved by the ark. And that is the like figure of Jesus. The ark is the savior, not the water, right? The water drowned everybody. Uh, They all went under. The other passage of scripture that we're looking at um, is uh, when Peter begins his message, it it clearly uh, helps us to understand that we are to repent and we are to follow in baptism. That is one of our uh, early commands that God has given us to follow in baptism, but it never ties baptism to our uh, salvation and and to the part that, that, you know, you don't do this, you're not going to heaven. He's talking about the processes of how we are moving in Christ. He says, you repent, you obey God and follow in baptism. And then he said, be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So he's given us a, a, the process of how things are going. He's not giving you uh, a directive on how to be saved, right? He's saying this, this is how things happen. You repent, you get baptized, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so it took, it took a little while, it took a few weeks. We examined many, many passages of Scripture, going back into the Old Testament, even looking at some of the things that uh, were taught to the children of Israel, the cleansing ceremonies, you know, how they used to uh, come to the temple and the, and the priest, they would bring an offering and, and uh, those, there were cleansing ceremonies and things like that. So we, it took a while. We won't go there today, all right? So first of all, people would maybe think, okay, so it's not salvation, Pastor. What... What is baptism if it's not a part of our salvation? A surprisingly large number of people, and even among Christians, I think, believe that baptism is kind of a Christian initiation, right? You, uh, it would be similar to, you know, it represents, you know, membership in a club, you know, like uh, you're going to join the Lions Club or the Rotary Club or, uh, you know, when I played sports and in football, we had some I hated it when I was a freshman. The, the initiation was horrible. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I, I loved it when I was a senior because, you know, I was a, a part of leading the group. Uh, we didn't do anything outrageous like you might see on television or, or hear about. But, there, you know, it's just, it's just no fun to be on the initiation side. And, uh, but those guys that were doing that were, you know, they're part of the club now. You know, they're, they're in with the guys and they're a part of the team and, and things like that. So all of us are kind of familiar with one, one way or another with, with initiation ceremonies and kind of what that means. And, uh, you know, is that, uh, you know, is that what water baptism is? Well, then my question to you would be, what club was Jesus joining when he was baptized? <laughs> So there must be something more to baptism than uh, what we think in terms of, is it connected to salvation or, um, you know, is it, so it's not, and, 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 or is it initiation? No, it's not an initiation. So there must be something more to water baptism than, than what we may think. And, and maybe you've never given deep thought about that. And, and uh, you know, so today I hope we can kind of get into this and, and better understand. You may see... Um, you may see water baptism as a, as a symbol of Christianity, but could there be something more involved in, in what's going on in, in water baptism than we actually think through? Now, as we examine this, I want to just throw out a warning early on, and that is that we're going to get into the forest. <laughs> we already have a little bit, but uh, this is a, a, a virtual rainforest, what this passage out of Colossians chapter 2 Uh, verse 15 of gospel timber. I mean, there is some deep, deep stuff, but I want us to kind of stay above it, get a little bird's eye view and come away with a better understanding of what water baptism is all about. In all, it's, it's really all about in this passage, what God has done for us and what God is, is doing in us. And uh, that's, that's the, that's what we inherit with through our Salvation relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, what has God done for us? Let's start there as we dig into this passage. And he says, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. 
The first enemy that Christ defeated for you and for me was a certificate of debt that was filed against us in the courtroom of heaven. In other words, because of our sin and our rebellion, the laws of God had become deadly witness against us, and we were standing in the court of God with no way out, no excuses, uh, no uh, you know, uh, time served, uh, good behavior uh, kind of situations. We were standing there fully guilty and fully condemned, rightfully by God's word. And so the very first thing that Jesus did was to cancel the enemy of debt uh, that our sin and our guilt had brought back against us. And it's, it's no small thing that he destroyed the debt that we owe. It opened for us the opportunity of eternity with him. Because it canceled out the debt. We, uh, we are unholy because of the sinful nature. Uh, because of the sin that separated us from God. We needed to clothe ourselves in the holiness of God in order to have a pathway in eternity into the presence of God. And, he's, and then he goes on to, to say about it. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing uh, over them by the cross. I, I rejoice every time I read that passage. I was in Bible quiz growing up as a, as a, a youth in, in our church, and we, had a, we, had, we didn't have a huge church. Our church was probably about 125 people, and uh, I was on a Bible quiz team that twice went to nationals, um, and, and you know, we, uh, the first time uh, we placed eight out of eight teams, and the second time uh, we placed uh, third. And um, this is a, a big thing. I know it's not big for us here. We don't really understand it. Um, it, it ties into uh, the movement that I was growing up in, the Assemblies of God. They're gonna be celebrating um, this uh, coming um, August. Uh, there'll be 35, 40,000 people uh, invade um, Orlando, Florida. And uh, many of these are gonna be Bible quiz teams from churches all over the nation. And uh, they, these guys are, are really good. They have these little pads and there's two teams. There's three on each team starters. And then you have backups because you can quiz out. You can like score a, a limit of points and you'll, you can quiz out. That happened to me once in my life. But uh, we had a, a solid team, a really good team. And they were so good that the, they would ask the question like this. They would say, when Moses, the buzzer would go off. When Moses uh, came to the children of Israel on Mount Riley, and they would finish the question and then answer it. I mean, these guys were amazing, you know. And so when I was in it, we had to memorize uh, Philippians, uh, Colossians, Galatians, and Ephesians. And so when I read this passage, it reminds me, because I, uh, I was the one who had to memorize all of Colossians. And uh, that's where my life passage comes out of, uh, chap chapter 3, verse 2. I set my affections on things above and not on things on the earth. I, when I read this, I rejoice because I remember memorizing this and thinking about what it meant. I got this picture of, of Jesus taking all of my sins and, and walking up to the, the, the debtor's door and sprinkling the blood of Jesus over them. They're paid and taking a big hammer and just driving a nail through that. Uh, that was the way it happened in the, in the Old Testament. When a debt got canceled, it was a, it was a paper that was taken to the debtor's uh, collection place and it was nailed up to say hey you know he no longer owes it's fully paid it's taken care of and a whole community got a chance to go by and see this oh ho, oh, Alan doesn't know anymore that's cool I'm gonna go see if I can take a loan out with him you know people knew when you had satisfied the debt right and so when I was reading this disarm the powers and authorities he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in the cross can you imagine what what it would have been like to you get that you know you've been you've owed for all these many years you pay your house off and and that gets tacked up where everybody can see and you're just sitting there kind of dancing around and just hey you should read this come here you should see I own my house now and it would be cool wouldn't it to, to live in a day in a time like that hey I own my farm now check this out you know it's all my car's paid off check it out it's really cool it would be awesome to have lived in a day like that and he, and he made a spectacle of them he triumphed over them it was like he danced on the enemy's head as he canceled our debt and the second enemy that he defeated 
uh, was the host of evil spiritual beings, the devil and his forces. It says um, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, also speaks of this. It says that we overcome the devil because of the blood of the lamb, the work that Jesus did at Calvary, and because of the word of our testimony, his salvation in our hearts and lives. And they did, uh, they did not love their uh, life even unto death. Um, now, this doesn't say we don't have to fight. We must fight, but the battle belongs to the Lord, and he dealt a decisive blow through his death. And so as long as we stay surrendered and we allow him to, to lead us and we allow his lordship to rule in our hearts and lives, we're victors. And we have the victory. Satan cannot destroy us. So then what is it that God has done in us? And he uses a couple of uh, two pictures, if you will, uh, one is circumcision and the other is resurrection to give us uh, a clear idea of what he has done in us. And so we read this passage a moment ago, I'll read it to you again. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins. When you and I were dead in sin, the first thing that he did was bring us to life spiritually in him. We were imprisoned, we were dead in, in our, our, our own spirit uh, to the things of life about God, the, the hope, the purpose, uh, our calling, the calling of God on our life, the fact that God has designed us and designed the world that we live in, and we were captives of whatever the philosophies of men might be. And we were believing and following along with that. And we were also captives of our own sinful nature, things we were addicted to, things that we were uh, being driven towards. And, and there was uh, often, uh, you know, there were seasons of us coming to a place of like, what's, what's this all about anyway? I mean, life just doesn't make sense with God not in it. And so there are definite moments where we arrived at places where we said, you know, this just doesn't make any sense. Why am I putting so much effort and so much work into living? You know, and so we try different things with our life. We think that, you know, we should, we should escape and get away. We work too much. We just need to get away and enjoy life. And we, we try all kinds of things, a work-life balance. And it just doesn't seem to make sense. And it's what Christ done in us that helps uh, make sense of it. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive. Christ forgave us all of our sins. And so you see what he does in us, that we are spiritually dead and he makes us alive. And this is the miracle of the new birth. It's the first thing that he did for us. You know, over the years as a pastor, when, when I've seen people born again, when they, they come to Christ and they, they surrender and make him the Lord and the leader of their life, I've had them tell me, you know, uh, Pastor, you know, it's, it's, it's strange, but people are nicer now at work. The grass is greener outside. Uh, you know, my wife and children are lovelier. It's just, I, I can't tell you how great life is now that I'm seeing it through a different set of eyes. I'm seeing things spiritually. I had a professor tell one of my uh, parishioners one time, they, he was uh, studying for psychology, and he told him, he said, uh, ahead, as they were getting enrolled in the program, he said, I just want to warn you, you know, I, I hear you're a Christian. He said, I want to warn you that you're not really uh, going to be able to do very well in this class because you're, you're bringing your Christian, you know, um, presuppositions to, to class. And he came back, he was discouraged, and he sat down, he was talking with me. And I said, well, why don't you set up a meeting with the professor and tell him uh, the reverse. Say, since you're not open to spiritual life, and what God is doing, you're hindered in helping people recover from the issues that are going on in their life because there's a measure of them that involve the spiritual and the supernatural. And they do not just involve the physical and the mental. And see what he says. And so he went down and had that conversation. He came back and he was beaming, he was smiling. He goes, my professor said, I think you may be right. <laughs> he said, maybe it's me that's bringing a bias to class because I can't see things from a Christian perspective. So as a Christian, I can see things from your perspective, too. I could see things that you're talking about that, that uh, has, is a, a work of science, things that, that people have understood about human behavior. I can see all that, but I can also see there's a supernatural force sometimes at work behind the lives of people that's disrupting them, depressing them, discouraging them, focusing them on suicide. And it's not all always just chemical imbalances. There are things that are happening in the lives of people that I know how to pray about. 
and ask Jesus to get involved in the process, right? And so there's a picture of that in verse 11. In him you were also uh, circumcised with, an uncircumcision, uh, with a circumcision not performed by human hands. We all rejoiced in that. Uh, your whole self ruled uh, by the flesh uh, was put off when you were circumcised in Christ. I, I want to skip to the chase here because we've gone a little bit long. I want to get to the meat of what is going on in this text. It, why is this, this different from the circumcision that was going on? And some people have tied um, baptism, you know, this, uh, this is why we won't baptism, you know, baptize infants and, uh, you know, young children. You know, they've, they've tied it to, some, some people have, to circumcision. They say, well, they, they got circumcised early, like day eight and a long time before they, they received Christ. And, uh, you know, uh, there are no amens on that one, right? So, um, <laughs> yes, yes, I totally agree with you. But what Paul's talking about was done without hands. Yes. What Paul's talking about here was done by, by God. Jack Hayford has an excellent book on uh, the rebuilding of you, uh, comparing it to what goes on in, in the rebuilding process of Nehemiah's wall. And that you and I need to be rebuilt in Christ. We have been damaged um, from early on, and we need to be rebuilt in Christ to understand and to see things uh, clearly. We are all bent in one direction or another based on our upbringing. Some of you had some horrible things happen to you early in life, and they have affected the way you see the world. They affected your world vision. You're bringing a bias every day into uh, life and into work. And this is a work that it needs to be done by God. And it's done without human hands. It's a circumcision and dividing. Uh, Jack Haverd was pointing out how the Bible tells us, and you may remember in, in uh, Timothy, that God takes his, his word, like the sword, and he divides between the spirit and the soul. Why would it be important that God use the word of God to divide like a knife between the spirit and the soul? Because our soulish nature our mind, will, and emotions wants to always take over and, 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 and affect our worldview and describe how things are and, and make us live by emotion and, and uh, feelings and, and whatever. It, it's clouding our view. And so God said, I'm just taking my word, bam, I'm going to divide it. So your spirit man has a chance to rise up and to voice and to say, this is what circumstance look like, but God is in charge. And my God will overcome, take away. So what then is baptism? As we start ex examining the, the very nature of it. Baptism is an external expression of a spiritual reality. That is precisely what we see in the link in verse 11 and 12. Christ does, not, uh, does this uh, circumcision without hands. Uh, the New Testament spiritual fulfillment of the Old Testament circumcision. And, and through your faith in the working of God, it says, who raised him from the dead. How does it happen? Through your faith, through your belief, uh, and your faith in the working of what God is doing, you were raised from the dead. Faith in Christ first, followed by baptism. Jesus commanded us to be baptized, to follow him in baptism. But in theological terms, it's an ordinance of the church. It's a command of God for us. But what baptism really is for us is a public proclamation. I'm making it public, what he has done in my life. And we see in the symbolism, what happens to us is what, what Jesus did at the cross, buried with him in baptism and raised up in resurrection. Amen. Buried with him and raised up. Baptism is not salvation. Baptism is not initiation. Baptism is a proclamation, a first act of obedience to Christ. Your story for God's glory. The story of what you used to be and the story of who you have become in Christ. Publicly lived out. This was the old me. This is the new me resurrected in Christ 
he opens this passage by telling us, and I'm going to invite our worship team to come back. What should I expect from you as a Christian? So in an initiation, you know, you can be initiated into something and then not really participate. Like you can not show up to all the team meetings and, you know, so you're not really, you were initiated, but you're not really participating, right? And so what does it mean to be a Christian? You know, what, what shows us that we're a Christian? And he opens that passage in uh, the opening verses there by telling us uh, verse 6 and, and 7 and then 8. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. So the first thing that we need to do is to continue to live our lives in him. Be faithful in the way that we're living and walking in our life. So what should I expect of you as a Christian? I should expect that you live faithfully as a Christian. That what you are saying to me and what you are doing matches. They both look the same. You're saying I'm a Christian and your actions are showing me that you're a Christian. You're, you're not perfect, but you're gracious, you're loving, uh, you're kind, you're gentle. Um, you know, you, you are faithful to God and faithful to worship and faithful to um, your, your relationship with him. I should expect that. And you should expect that from me as a Christian. The second thing he says is rooted and built up and strengthened in the faith as you were taught. Rooted and built up. This is speaking about our part in the discipleship process. So it's you need two pieces. Uh, you go to school. Uh, you go to college, you enter into university, and you say, you know, uh, you spend four years and you leave and you say, they taught me nothing about marketing. And I would say, really? I mean, what classes did you have? Oh, I didn't go to any of my classes. You what? You didn't go to any of your classes? I paid the money, you know. <laughs> well, that's nice, you know. I mean, you do have to go to class because you have to partner with the teacher. The teacher can't teach you something if you're not going to be a student, right? So you had to be a student. You have to go. You have to sit there. You have to listen. You have to learn, right? You have to, you have to learn. And, and if you don't, then uh, what expectation, expectation would you have of, of being uh, all knowing about marketing? You don't even know the terms, the big ideas about what this is all about. You need to go back and actually go to class. And then you can graduate, right? So rooted and built up in him. And then uh, the, the next thing it says there is overflowing uh, or, or strengthened, I'm sorry, in, in, in your faith uh, as you were taught. Strengthened in your faith. So this is an ongoing process. It's a, it, discipleship is for life. It is for me too. I wish I could say, boy, I'm finished as a pastor. I got done with Bible school. You know, I'm, I'm about to finish uh, a degree, a master's degree. And I'd, I'd like to just say, hey, you know, once that's done, I'm all finished learning. But it's been lifelong. Believe me, I, I'm always being taught. And it, it isn't always people way above me either. Sometimes the children are teaching me something or, uh, you know, elderly people are teaching me something. There's a lifelong learning that's going on. And that's what he's talking about. I should expect that from you as a Christian. And then finally, it says overflowing with thanksgiving. I'm looking for people when I'm looking for Christians who have a, a gratitude about life, not an expectation. You owe me. You should have got. Why don't I have? Where's mine? But I'm looking for people who are Christians who have this overflowing gratitude for every breath. You know, there's so many times we're driving around as a family and um, the, the only thing that's kind of going on is just gratitude. Just, you know, oh, man, I'm just God. We're just so thankful. Thank you. Thank you. And Michelle and I. Uh, a number of times traveling around just driving thank you god that you've you've given us the privilege of of working at this church and pastoring here thank you god that you you know for this city thank you for our community thank you for our home thank you for our children we're looking for um people as christians who also have that who have that that humility that gratitude that thankfulness for every breath i'm closing with uh with this uh thought uh, I love spending time with my granddaughter and uh, we got to spend some time with her yesterday and we took her places and did some things and had fun, you know, and, and when it was time to, to say goodbye, you know, she, her mom always says, you know, we're going to leave. And she goes, two minutes, two minutes. And her mom puts two minutes on the thing. And then, you know, it goes off. The alarm goes off. Ding, 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 ding. has this little song thing when it goes off, you know. And when she hears it, she goes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. She's not through. Her and Papa were still playing, you know, and doing things. And, 
And so her mom had walked off. She had reset the alarm for like the third or fourth time, right, for the two minutes. And her mom had walked off to with, with uh, Michelle to go see something. And the alarm goes off. And she goes, oh, two minutes. Oh, she realized her mom wasn't there. And so she walks over to the phone. She goes, poop, presses the button to turn it off. She comes back and we start playing, right? When she left, you know, I'm saying, God, I just thank you for my granddaughter and for every minute that we've had together. I have no expectation that I'm going to get another minute. You know, that's your grace and your mercy in my life. But thank you for every minute I've had. As a pastor for 35 years now, I have done funerals for little tiny babies and young children. And and I've done funerals for people my age, you know. And so I have no expectation. I have a hope, but I have no expectation that tomorrow I'm going to get another opportunity and it's all going to be the same every single day. So I'm living in gratitude. And that's what Christianity is about, too. It's, and, and that's what we're looking for from one another as, as Christians. I'm looking for people who are grateful for every moment. We stand with me as we worship the Lord. And let's take this moment to just express our gratitude to God as we sing and worship.